Um, why don't we get started? Um, first off, to start, um, there's an Eastern proverb, and some of you might know that I like my proverbs, that hearing something 100 times is not as good as seeing it once. And so we talk a lot about the IDA grant and all these pieces. And so being here and, and seeing these pieces and going into the application itself, I think will hopefully be impactful and that you can take with you. I do have uh, multiple slides in here that are for people as well. Later on when this is posted, they'll be able to download some of this information um, as we move forward. So um, getting started, whenever I get around people uh, talking about the IDA grant, um, we're going to be going over some of the elements, um, in particular around the application uh, for the subgrantee end of things. Um, we're going to be going over a brief overview of IDEA, review of the e-grant, changes to the FY21 application in particular. Um, uh, some of the MOE pieces that we are going to be having still the version 1.3 and now going to a 1.4 extended, and I'll explain those pieces, and I'll steal my own thunder. There's gonna be a, a two-hour Zoom uh, webinar at the end of this month. There's two different times around MOE in particular. So if this is something that um, you and your team uh, should try to plan to be at or listen to, um, that would be really helpful for you. Um, some of the recalculations with the final award that we did and then the updates in relationship to the grant itself. So whenever I again around people and like to talk about that the reason the purpose for the IDEA grant is to assist with the excess costs of providing special education and related services to children with disabilities. And, and that's the real key to the grant. And if you can justify that excess cost ends of things around providing special education and related services, that's the purpose of the grant. Again, excess costs has nothing to do with the state excess cost grant. Um, uh, so uh, we'll talk more about this a little bit later. So those who've been around a little while, the grant is broken up into two sections, section 611. Um, that um, state identification number is 20977. So you might see that some places as well, in particular around the prepayment grant system. And that's around ages 3 to 21, um, where IDA Part B section 619, and again, that ID for our purposes in the um, grant side is 20983, and that's for our students ages um, children ages three to five the state ap application in particular we all know it's a two-year cycle right um, federal fiscal year 19 um, was in place um, the federal fiscal year um, is a little different funding cycle and so we sometimes call it the federal fiscal year of 19 and then the fiscal year of 20 um, 6 7 1 19 to 6 30 20 and then 7120 through 63021 is the two years of the FY20 grant. The FY19 grant is sundowning, is ending um, in June, June 30th. Um, the um, date by which that you're supposed to get in those budget revisions was back um, on February 1st. Um, but the two year grant is coming through. And then there's the subgrantee of the state award um, that we'll be talking about around eligible LEAs for that application. Um, last year's FY20 grant um, in particular, for people to be aware, there is um, broken up into three areas. This is a federal formula that comes to us. Um, 3.2 and change for administrative, um, almost 14 million for other state activities. And then the flow through to the LEAs is $123 million, which is approximately 88% of the award is uh, sent through to flow through to the LEAs by which that subgrantee application is done. Um, again, it's a federal formula that is based upon both an established base rate, um, poverty, and then census that changes the different amounts that the LEAs get and as we move forward into next year, FY, FFY20 and FY21, um, that's right around the corner. Um, and I'll be getting that information from the Bureau of Grants Management over the next few weeks. So things to know again about the grant um, is that it covers that time frame. Um, we don't want you to spend your monies equally over two years. You want to spend approximately 85% in year one. And then you have that carryover piece into year two. 
But the real key with this, and as I talk about a lot, is to ensure that you're spending old money before new, meaning that you're able to liquidate that older money. Right now you have two pots of money by which that we're dealing with that carryover money of that second year of FY19 and first year of FY20. And you wanna make sure that we're liquidating all of our FY19 funds. And then as well, your set aside funds, which we'll be talking about more in a little bit around areas of proportionate share and for coordinated early intervening services or CEIS. Those set-asides really need to be expended in that first year of your grant cycle. Um, that was the obligation that you made to those non-public schools and to the commitment in relationship to what you'd be doing with the CIS funds with your plan to, to the State Department. So you want to be looking to ensure that those monies are used in that first year. More things to know. Again, you need to continue to have a separate accounting system um, for that audit trail around your expenditure of funds, around the grant. There shouldn't be any, uh, it's prohibited from commingling of funds. Um, and then funds must be used to supplement um, state and local um, effort and, and not supplant. Um, and we'll talk more about this in a little bit. Again, that's around the whole aspect of maintenance of effort. Um, and it must be demonstrated both from an eligibility and a compliance standard. And again, both of these pieces we'll be touching on later. Just real quick for MOE, and I don't want to talk too much about MOE because that's going to happen again later in the month. But basically, in plain language, the eligibility standard requires that the LEA must budget at least the same amount or more for special education as the LEA spent for the most recent fiscal year for which information is available. And unless allowable exceptions or adjustments apply, the LEA is then not going to be eligible for Part B grant award. Same with the compliance side is that it requires LEA must not reduce the level of expenditures. So we're looking at what you actually expended for special education below the level of expenditures from the last previous year the district met MOE and it's called the subsequent year rule that we look at unless allowable exceptions or adjustments apply. And again, the LEA is uh, responsible to keep that in all your data to justify and explain uh, the MOE to ensure it's satisfied. So let's look at the e-grant. Um, a lot of you probably haven't gone into this since last year, um, although it's available for you. Um, the great thing about the e-grant is right now that uh, it's already going to be preloaded in relationship to preliminary dollars will be in there. Um, there's always confusion. This is a prepayment grant system that we deal with. So we give the money up front um, and then you tell us how much you're expending, right? So the preliminary dollars are actually going to be your FY20 dollars that you're going to be making your budget from and putting into the FY21 application. That is then adjusted later on when the real numbers come down, when the final award is done. And then again, there's sometimes an adjustment that needs to be made. There is part of the fiscal self-assessment. It's part of our fiscal monitoring. Um, before this was a separate piece um, that we've now been able to bring that into the application itself. Um, and validation errors. Um, we're trying to make this as um, easy as possible that if you don't fill out a section properly or you're going through it and you inadvertently don't fill out a section, the application is going to give you that validation error and let you know that a section is not complete. Um, and so once it's approved all the way through the CSDE, we can't go back. Um, before when we had paper applications, um, we could make, you know, you'd send me something to replace a page or something like that. Um, that's why it's important that right now, once it becomes um, set, this is the document that's going to become part of the record. Um, one thing to note as well is around significant disproportionality, and it's called mandated CES, CCES, or Comprehensive Coordinated Early Intervening Services. Um, these applications might take a little bit longer for those districts that are identified with significant disproportionality. Um, we're um, trying to get some systems in place to make this so that we know this ahead of time, but be aware that as the applications are going through, that if your district is identified, um, we may have to adjust this because mandated CCEIS 
is you're mandated to set aside 15% of the total award of your grant. Um, and so that'd be something that we'd have to put in there and then you have to identify those pieces. But we'll get into CCIS and CIS again in a few minutes. So this is actually the system. This is the portal that you'd be going in for your um, uh, for the e-grant. Um, and, and again, um, you know, in general, you sign in with your email address and your password. If you don't know your password, and nowadays everyone kind of knows that, you click on that and it sends you a login through your email and then it kind of reroutes you back into the system and then you can put that information in. We are going to be looking at the test site a little bit later and we're going to use test as a password but if you want to go in anytime to your district um, and do the test site you're more than willing to do that. Um, we haven't posted this yet um, the uh, hope is that we're working out some of the kinks that I actually even found today a kink in it that that I'll be bringing to your attention um, but of where um, we'll be uh, uh, moving through this and doing the test site in a little bit so the real key remember to save your work while you're in the e-grant um, there's a 60 minute timeout session um, and you want to make sure any work you've done, you're able to click it off and, and save it. Even going into the same page will save it uh, of the work that you've done. There are roles um, that, that are established. Um, every district is required to have a user access administrator, and that's somebody in your building. Someone who works with you is your user access administrator because other grants beyond the IDEA are in this system. As well, there's going to be identified an uh, IDEA 611 contact and a 619 contact. Can be the same person, can be different, but both of these individuals will have the authority to go in and be able to modify pieces within the grant itself. And then there's the superintendent, which is required, and then a data review piece as well. The thing to note is that once this is available, um, it's available for the public to review. You do not need a password to go look at the pieces of the grant. So we want to make sure that what we're putting in there are things by which that we can stand by. The real key to the grant is that at times people will go in there and they get frustrated because they can't put data in when they're authorized to do so and start, what has to happen is the status has to be changed. As you see here on the sections page, application status not started is what you're currently in. And you have to change your status to application started. That's real important to note and we'll show that example in a little bit. So once you click that, Application started is now the application status that you're in for the application. And then change status to application completed. That'll be when you're done. You'd be do application completed. That's the next thing to do. The workflow itself, again, you're, when you open it up, you're not started. You need to application started you need to switch this on right there in that sections uh, the sections part uh, the top of the sections page application completed when you're done you'll be changed into that it's then going to go to your superintendent who's either going to approve it or return it back to you for clarification around your pieces and as i've shared before that the superintendent by his approval and sending it through to the State Department is actually his electronic signature saying that he has approved the application. We're able to get clarification from OSEP around this and that we do not need a hard signature anymore. The CSDE and BSE then would come to me. I would either approve it or return it back to you for some clarification around certain sections and then it's released. So here's the sections page. Um, at first, it's a little overwhelming, but it, it might have some recollection to you where we have our status area at the top that I just talked about. The first part up there is around the login um, and clarification for communication between us if possible. 
collapsing or expanding the different se sections of the grant. And then each grant has its own budget section down below, both 611 and 619. These are the information uh, IDA section pages in general. The assurances section is districts must affirm assurances, meaning you're going through and you're going to look at all these pieces. Um, and except for shared services, um, which is a fiscal agent and does not receive any allocations, um, all districts are going to be doing this piece. Um, same with your fiscal self-assessment. The private school proportionate share piece is in there. And this is for non-public um, schools that are in the geographic borders must be completed and in indicating the number of parentally placed private school students. And then you're going to do the calculation for a proportionate share piece by which is a set aside to be used with that, um, how the district determines uh, the money will be spent. This is determined in your meaningful consultation time, um, which is one of the related documents that needs to be uploaded of when you had your conversation with those non-publics, who attended it, and the number <coughs> excuse me, of students identified. There's the CEIS section, which is Coordinated or Intervening Services. Um, this has three areas. Um, if it's not applicable, voluntary or mandated, and in this section of the application, I'll be showing you this, there's a slight change um, because the mandated section was, as we discovered, you could actually click out of that and that's not something you should be able to do. So this is been arranged a little bit differently. Um, again, both voluntary and mandated, you must complete certain pieces within this and you're gonna be tracking students impacted by those funds for two years. Some of the differences, for real quick, around voluntary is that it's for non-disabled students, those high-risk students that you'd be tracking and determining if they were referred to special education. And then mandated has to do with that area of significant disproportionality where you would be contacted by the State Department and uh, you're able to be indicated of the area that you're having um, identified and that there's a mandated set aside of 15% voluntaries up to 15%. But on that mandated side, it's for both with students without disabilities and with students with disabilities. That's why it's comprehensive coordinated early intervening services. Program options, this is something that no one in the, in the state does. We offer it to you. Um, this is disabled and you click this if you are opting in. Uh, contact me because we need to coordinate um, with other um, uh, resources to try to have that piece done if you're gonna be doing that. Um, there's the two sections on the goals, both for 611 and 619. And it's important that if you're gonna be recording the 619 goal, my colleague, Andrea Brunel, she's the 619 coordinator. Um, she's gonna be reviewing these pieces in relationship to 619 in particular. So identifying that by saying three to five year olds will be very helpful and will let her know that that's what the resources and activities are for. Maintenance of effort, we talked, I explained this a little bit, and I'll go over the section in particular around eligibility and compliance. Every district needs to do this. Um, the excess cost piece, um, again, this has nothing to do with the State Department of Education's excess cost grant. It has to do with elements around uh, elementary and secondary pieces, and we'll look at this. Um, you can check not applicable, say if you're only an elementary school, um, you know, K-8, you would not be obviously doing secondary pieces, um, but you decide as the district what is elementary and what is secondary, where those breaks happen. And then professional development and parent participation. Um, this is going to be an uh, element that's still recorded for what you're going to be doing for training. There are th three budgets available for us in this um, e-grant. The first one in the out of the allocations, you'd be pulling in your public school activities. And again, there's a shell in there of the ED114 that kind of is the, the basis by which that we have um, the budget established. Um, 
one thing to be aware of for all of the allocations and budgets, we're only using a quantity of one and you're explaining and breaking down the information in the narrative description. So in 111B, which would be for um, uh, uh, salaries, um, for salaried employees, um, it's called uh, instructional. Um, you'd be saying that of the $400,000, one 111B of $400,000, which would be four special education full-time teachers. Um, we're also looking to use only whole dollars. Um, this piece, once it's all approved, then gets uploaded into the prepayment grant system. The prepayment grant system only uses whole dollars. One thing to really note and that it's kind of confusing is we're also rolling up to the next whole dollar. We are not going to be using round down if you have under 50 cents and over 50 cents up. We're rolling up everything up to that next dollar. Private school activities, um, this is for proportionate share. From the allocations, you're gonna be using your set aside. Um, again, you're gonna see at times with this calculation that there's gonna be cents there. We're gonna be using whole dollars up to that next one. And same with CEIS, CCEIS, there's in the section, it allows you to do some calculations and breaks it down for you so you can find out how much you're going to be setting aside for these pieces. This is what the budget page looks like. Um, it has the three pieces of a public school activities, private school activities, coordinated intervening school services activities. And those would be the pieces by which you'd be manipulating. The budget itself and the editing of these details, you may already have pieces in there, but it's pretty straightforward that when you're in that budget page, you can look at it by either object code, code or purpose code. The budget details page will list all the details for the budget code. And if you have more than 10, you can just have multiple pages. You find the detail to the edit, you click on it, and you go into those pieces and you make your changes as needed and explaining in the narrative. So some of the changes you can expect and the reason why I'm gonna be going over these before we go into the grant is because some of them you might never see. It's more the validation part of things. Um, but as a resource, there's um, some, the video of the training from last year that's in there. So you have some new person that you'd want to see that or yourself for a refresher. Um, there's a flow chart and guidance in particular around MOE as well. Um, that shows how long we'll be needing that extended version and then maintaining the 1.3. Under assurances at the bottom, um, places of performance just to make things uniform. Everybody's gonna putting in their address there at the bottom. I'll show you that in a moment. Um, we gave clarifying language to ensure that you're aware that it's the 10, 1, 19, child count that you'll be putting into your um, uh, elements in the application for proportionate share for those um, uh, private school parentally placed private school students um, the formula for total uh, is the total of the 2021 award um, there are uh, minimum uh, primary uh, preliminary obligations meaning that you need to make sure that um, if you have students that are on 619, that those numbers align with what you've put in to the State Department around your child count numbers. There's a budget validation piece, and then as well that you're rolling up. If you're not rolling up, you're going to get an error message. CEIS, um, these are some of the changes there. Again, having that budget validation piece that we just talked about rolling up to the next dollar, and as well as the students changed, uh, the student serves, should I say, um, was changed um, both to reflect if you used CIS last year and moving into this year's use. And then checking off if you're not using CIS or mandated, you voluntarily fill out the section. And I'll show this in a minute of the changes. Excess cost has to be a positive number. Remember, 
that when you're talking maintenance of effort, we're talking about your special education budget. When you're talking excess cost calculations, and this is excess cost in the grant in relationship to the section of the grant, you're dealing with your general educational budget. You're then backing out some of the um, special education numbers around your 611 and 619. That number has to be positive. In the past, sometimes districts are placing in their special education budget and then backing out special education numbers and then they were coming up with zero and negative numbers. That can't be. And then related documents around the MOE, but having two elements, you'll be uploading both version 1.3 and 1.4. And we'll be going over this in detail. Speaking of which, here's some of the changes in the application itself. Last year, as you might recall, you're having to take numbers from the MOE calculator themselves and place them into the MOE calculator. It was a little confusing which number went where. So all we're going to request is that by your uploading the 2, the 1.3, and the 1.4, I'll be reviewing the numbers in particular, while all you have to identify is did you meet, meet with exceptions, or did you not meet? There is language in there for you to understand that if you check not met, it indicates the LEA is unable to meet under MOE eligibility standard. That would be that you weren't able to meet the FY21, uh, you weren't able to get the application, uh, I'm sorry, you're not able to get the funds because you need to meet the eligibility standard to get the uh, IDEA grant. Similarly, if you did not meet for compliance, you're saying that you weren't able to meet compliance, and what that means, you're going to have to repay dollars in non-federal dollars to OSEP. Um, you'd give it to the State Department, and we'd forward it along. We'll talk about this in a minute. So let's go into the e-grant real quick um, and go into some of these pieces that I've been talking about. Okay, hello Greg. Um, so I'm looking to get into this one over here. We go test site. So this is a test site that we're going to be using to talk about the FY21 application. We're going to sign in, and I'm going to be signing in as my colleague from the um, the vendor. Um, just so I can go into some of these systems a little bit easier. Um, hold on one second. I want to find the exact name here. Here we go. I'm sorry. Here we go. So this is going to be um, M. Crawford. So as you remember, this is what the, the login section looks like um, as we're going through this. And it's um, at hmbnet.com. And as I said before, we're just going to use the password of test. This will always tell you if you're in test mode versus production mode. Oops. So we'll say never here. So we're in right now, and just for funding application side of things, I'm going to go and find Avon. We've got to change our fiscal year because we're going to 221, IDEA. And then we're going to go find it. Here it is here. And the application is going to come up. Again, this is the FY21 um, test site. And so we're going to be looking at pieces in relationship to this. Um, here is the sections uh, all throughout here that we'll be working with. And as I said before, you want to look at the assurances, which is the first one. 
And this is something by which you're gonna click all these pieces because these are saying that you're abiding by IDEA and principles that are related here in the state of Connecticut. And down below here at the bottom, places of performance is where you'd be putting in your Board of Education address or any other needed. There is, if you need more, um, you can pass them, uh, add more lines. So I can then go to the next page here. And in the next page is the fiscal self-assessment. Everybody has to do this. So I'm gonna try and, wait a second, this isn't working for me. Why isn't this working? Oh, that's right. I never clicked start. So I have to go back to the sections page. Remember, and what am I gonna do? I have to go back to application status is change status to application started. I'm gonna confirm that that is happening. Come on. And now, as you see, application status changed. It changed that I'm now application started. And then when I'm done with this application, I would then go to application completed. So I want to go back into that fiscal self-assessment section. Sorry, I keep messing this up. Here we go. Into fiscal self-assessment. And there you see, I can start filling out these different pieces as I go along. So let's go into another district. We'll go into Union. Um, let's see, that's okay. So let's go into Union because I've done some work in there already and I wanna show you some examples that are available for us. Come on. I'm not doing well with this. Uh, it's not my machine. So you know how that goes. Kill that, thank you. Here we go. My phone's ringing, apologize. Okay, so now we're in Union. Um, in here, as I said before, I already started, my application started for this. Some of the history log and communication, and this is where my allocations would be. And you can always go and see what your allocations are for your grant, and in particular here around IDEA 611 and 619. These are the funds that I have and uh, that I'm gonna be working from. Again, this is um, preloaded um, and, and it's FY 20 numbers. We already looked at fiscal self-assessment, but what I want to start is going into the private school, private share piece. In particular, um, this district, um, def um, these are numbers that I made up um, and they don't have even a uh, proportionate share calculation, but I wanted to show you that by placing in the total number of students for parentally placed uh, uh, private school students, um, that's what you put in this first box here. And then the total number of district students you're placing in this box there, it does the calculation for you. This is the added piece down here where it's the total number of students with disabilities on the October 1st, 2019 um, numbers that you'll be putting into here, okay? So we see that the proportionate share set aside would be for 459.68 and 164.22. Remember, this is now going to be rolling up to the next whole dollar of 460 would be the set aside and 165 would be the set aside. We wouldn't be rolling down. So you can do this either by sections like this or going back into the whole sections page. And as you see, my time just reset. Or you can go in by page by page. So let's look at some of the changes that are to the CES section. This was actually just discovered today, this morning, as we were working with this. And so what was occurring is that the LEA is mandated section could be clicked off. And this is gonna to have to be something by which that's clicked on that, oops, is going to let us know if the district has to set aside mandated set aside. 
Now here is where you either click that my district is not mandated to use CEIS, nor is it voluntary using CEIS. When I click that, both of these sections are gray. When I unclick that, I can then be voluntarily using CEIS. And this is where I'd be putting in the specific activity, say SRBI. Oops, I didn't that work. Here we go. SRBI we're going to be working on around, say, third graders. Um, the cost of 1744 because I know that's 15% of my grant. Because right up here is where it tells me what is 15%. I rolled up to that next whole dollar. And I'm going to be using that money as a set aside for my students for SRBI voluntarily. If this was mandated, again, depending upon how we roll this out this year, you'll either be notified or it'll be preloaded mandated for you where you would then be explaining, is this gonna be something around your entire school, a targeted school, what your 15% is, and in here for mandated, you'd be describing it in relationship to how you're gonna be addressing um, elements uh, specifically around programmatic monitoring which is the significant disproportionality. So next page. This would be program options, and this has remained the same. Again, you'd have to check to opt in here. Nobody in the district is doing this at this time. So again, communicate with me if you're deciding to do that. We're then going to go into the sections page back to all the list as I'm going along. These would be the goals. The goals haven't changed. You'd be doing those. We're going to wait on maintenance of effort for a second. We'll go into excess cost. Again, excess cost. This is the LA expending the following amounts of funds from the preceding school year. So this is the expenditures you did for your entire uh, general educational budget all of the mounts that you put in there oops and you're going to back out capital outlay debt and then the pieces of your idea grant are all backed out oops and somehow i just lost the screen so uh, maybe i toggled it so let me find uh Escape. Here we go. Thank you, Greg. So here is the calculations for this particular district. Again, this is a little large. So I want to probably um, reduce this, but the um, uh, this district only does elementary district, um, and so right now I checked off not applicable, and I wouldn't have to fill in data for this. As you see, all of these are grayed out here because it's not applicable. Where up here, there's still white sections that would need to be filled out. So I'm going to go back to the sections page. The sections page shows all these pieces. You still do your professional develop and then into your budget. Let's just go into the budget. This is by purpose or by object. I'm going to make this a little bigger. So in here, the public school activities and coordinated or intervening services. I already placed these, these data points in here. The calculator didn't put it, the e-grant didn't do that for me. What I did is I went in and I modified from the allocation. So I'm going to edit and here, I'm deciding instead of that 1544, I'm going to only use 1344 for SRBI for third graders. I'm going to update that. When we look over here, now I have remaining $200. I could put this now into this um, supply line, or I could add another line. 
whatever I need to do. I'm just going to increase my supplies because um, some of the books cost more money in the curriculum. I'm going to update that. That was changed, as you see here, where it's still the total amount of 1744. I changed that within this piece of things, and then it's back to remaining zero. As you might recall, we had some private school activities that we need to add in. So now I have some elements there that I need to do. I'm going to add to that budget. I'm going to change it to um, instructional salaries. I'm going to do one. And the cost was going to be, um, I could go back to that section, but just for uh, convenience sake, we'll say it's $145. one para educator create uh oh what happened I now have remaining of negative so I need to go back into my allocation which would be the public school activities and I need to reduce that to make that remaining of zero so Gonna have to reduce this, so I want to edit. And uh, math off the top of my head is gonna be two fifty six. Is that gonna work? Let's give it a try. Update. Bang. So now I'm back to remaining zero. And you see that the private school activities now has an allocation. So as I said before, let's go quickly now back to maintenance of effort in that section. Maintenance of effort, this has a little bit different. Again, we're not gonna be putting data into this section anymore. We're just gonna be recording for both your eligibility and when I say eligibility, Think your budget of your future next year's budget is what eligibility standard is. And you're either going to check met, not met, or met with exceptions. When you hit met, you're then going to put down which type of resource did you use for that comparison. Remember, there's four ways by which that you can demonstrate MOE. That's a comparison of local funds the combination of state and local funds and per capita of each. So you're just going to see which of the very graphic, and we'll go over MOE in a second in the calculator overall, um, which of these pieces was met and what area were they met in. So for local funds, it was met for um, eligibility standard. And then we'll come down for compliance standard. Now you don't need to use the same methodology for compliance and eligibility. Around compliance standard, we're talking about expenditures. What did you do in the past? So we're gonna be looking, it was met with exceptions, and we're gonna say that it was met with the exceptions of, uh, say, the combination of state and local funds, but with the exception, and the reason why the exception was there, that we had had um, the termination of a costly obligation, meaning that a student with an IEP was no longer required to um, have that. So say a kid either graduates, um, say a student moves out of district, um, et cetera. As you see down here, there's templates that's available for you of both your calculator 1.3 and the 1.4, which is the new version of the extended version. And I'll be going over this in a moment, where you would upload these into the application and that will allow me to look at what did you say in relationship to was it met, met with exceptions, and then go from there. Just to clarify once again, if you clicked not met around the eligibility standard, checking not met indicates the LEA is unable to meet the MOE eligibility standard and would be ineligible for FY21 IDA Part B funds. 
please contact the Bureau of Special Education to explore options regarding exceptions. See below, you have the same exceptions you can use. And the LA's projected special education budget. And again, we're going to be talking about your 2021 budget of what you're going to be spending is what eligibility is around. So we'd be looking at those two pieces. Versus compliance standard is a little different. If you had to check not met, if all of them were not met, and this is looking basically from your um, 18, 19 backwards in relationship to where you're going to be meeting it. Understand that this 1920 year is your intervening year. We don't know how much you expended, and the budget that you had for projection is what you're working off of. So in this intervening year that we're in, that's why that's not the number we'd be looking at. We're looking at next year's budget for eligibility and what you expended in the past. So checking not met for compliance indicates the LEA is unable to meet the MOE compliance standard. Please contact the Bureau of Special Education to explore options regarding adjustments and exceptions. Again, we have exceptions down here regarding actual special education expenditures. So let's look at, um, we can close this out and go back into the, um, uh, the presentation. Um, uh, just one more thing while we're in here, might as well show you. Um, go back to the sections page. Um, if you ever want to know who does what in your district, go to the, the address book. Address book would, come on, show you who's available for your application, for who works on which uh, grant in, in union. Um, Steve does a lot of the work in relationship to IDEA and his title work. Um, and then the other CDSDE resources, etc., is all here available for you. Okay, so do I just close this out? Great, thanks. And we're back to the presentation, so we're going to move all the way up to here. Hopefully, that made sense, everybody. So let's look at MOE. Now, the MOE calculator is there as a way by which, as a tool for you as a district to use, and that we're requiring to be part of the application so that we have a standard way by which everybody is doing this. Basically, it was made by the Center for IDA Fiscal Reporting, and they worked with Connecticut to have this in place for us. And all the MOE calculator is is an Excel spreadsheet. It's broken into a cluster of three pieces for each fiscal year. As you see down below here, the 15-16 amounts, the 15-16 for both the amounts page, for the calculator itself, and then the exceptions or adjustments. This three of them work together, where the 15-16 MOE is able to go back and look at information from the summary page. Because as you remember, it does a comparison to the last time you met MOE. That's the subsequent year rule. And that's why we use this kind of very elaborate kind of Excel spreadsheet. All the Excel spreadsheet is doing is that when you see a red uh, tab, that's an amounts page. And you're putting in data in there. The blue is the calculator itself. It's taking the amounts and doing comparisons to earlier years. And then every orange would be an exception or adjustment for that year. And as we talked about, there are several different types of uh, exceptions that are available for you to put in. And it does the calculations for you. So you know already where you have a shortfall or not and how many exceptions or adjustments you need as a way by which to adjust any shortfalls. In this calculator, white spaces are filled out from other data. So if you get an error message, it's just looking for data from someplace else, where shaded spaces are what you're putting in there. You can even copy and paste from one shaded area to another and from one MOE calculator file of, say, the 1.3 into the 1.4 version. But always copy and paste. 
you never want to cut and paste because in a spreadsheet if you cut and paste you're taking the formulas that allow it to make its calculations always copy and paste so that being said MOE is an important part of things because consequences for MOE failure is once again if you fail the eligibility standard the IDA Part B grant is not awarded to you if you fail compliance standard you have to repay the federal government out of non-federal dollars because you didn't abide by what you said of expending the same if not more on students with disabilities and as well the calculator clarifies how much you would need to owe in column O on the summary page it shows very clearly what you have in relationship to that here's an example of a summary page it's rather graphic it shows the different methodologies at the top where you go there's the fiscal year standard child count and then right here the local amount is one of the the methods by which you can demonstrate MOE a local amount the state and local amount combined local amount per capita and state and local per capita those are the four methods you use and here's the information that it's doing the comparisons and you see if it was met or met did not meet as well it shows the repayment amount if you did not meet of what you would need to do now wait a second you're saying why isn't there money here well because you only need to meet MOE in one of the four methods so this year here of an eligibility standard you met in one of these two methods therefore you're all set so as I've been talking about there are now going to be a 1.4 extended version in place and I want to explain why that's needed but in general on the CSTE website is the portal where the new 1.4 version can be found and as well directions around how to transfer information here is the 1.3 data entry version as you see on the left here the standards that are in place is that for last year's application the FY20 grant application we were looking at compliance around the 2017-18 year back because we were in actually 1819 this was our intervening year and where 1920 was actually our eligibility we were looking at what the 1920 budget was going to be in relationship to this you can see that this entire crack, um, you know square in, in in worksheet is filled to the top where 1920 was the last year therefore we need to extend what we have already done and to continue it forward because for the FY 21 application we're going to be looking at MOE compliance for 2018-19 we're in our intervening year of 1920 and therefore the eligibility standard will be for 2021 this is a uh, is a flowchart that shows you in relationship to FY 21 IDA part B that we're going to be needing this in relationship to the MOE calculator we're completing the 1819 MOE compliance standard in the version 1.3 and then we're going to paste data that's already been completed for compliance into the 1.4 for measurement in relationship to compared to the eligibility standard 1b you're completing 21 2021 and that's going to continue right the eligibility standard for 2021 we're then going to look at next year's FY22 application. We're still going to need to complete our 1920 year for compliance. But we're going to be moving into a second year of the extended version of the 1.4. And then in FY23, we're no longer going to need the 1.3. We're going to be moving the 1.4 forward. You still need to hold on to that data if you audit it 
but from that end of things, the new calculation or calculator at that time would just be the 1.4. So one more time, here's the 1.3 to the 1.4 extended. You see in 1819 that we completed our compliance standard here by placing in data into the 1.3 version. We then can copy this entire block into the 1.4 version. This is then going to come in here, and here is the 1.4 extended. As you see, it continues onward through 2021 through 2025. The data we've put in here is data that we've already completed and is then doing its comparisons. So in this particular case, you can see the intervening year of 1920, we basically are working from, and our eligibility is future with, met with exceptions for these pieces. In relationship to compliance, it as well would have been met with exceptions. So that's what we would be putting into the um, e-grant, would be for compliance, would be met with exceptions, and then defining what those are. Same with eligibility. You'd say met with exceptions and then clicking on those. Again, in the four methods of uh, exceptions available to us are one, that if you had uh, staff that would have left voluntarily, and in the calculator, it has pieces by which, and I'll be going over this at the end of the year, uh, end of the month, around how to identify which uh, staff left and if you hired other staff. It'll do the calculations for you. Did you have a reduction in your uh, overall uh, census for uh, students with disabilities? That would be an exception. And that's calculated for you as well. And it's real important you're placing in your child count numbers because this will do the calculation for you without you even knowing. There's, did you have uh, a student no longer require um, an IEP and specialized instruction? So from that end of things, those students would be identified with their SASID numbers and again, the reason why they no longer required services. Lastly would be if you had a high cost expenditure that you're no longer using and um, you would identify what that is. And again, I'll be explaining more of this in the trainings. And those trainings are going to be on February 25th or the 27th. They're going to be in the morning on the 25th in the afternoon on the 27th. There are resources available for you, excuse me, on the CSDE website. These are here that show in relationship to um, uh, trainings and resources that you might need, in particular around the 1.4 and 1.3. And then back to the grant, you'd be uploading both the 1.3 and the 1.4 extended versions. Both are required. If you're not uploading both, you will get an error message. As needed, if you're part of a consortium, which we'll talk about in a second, you would have to put in your letter of agreement, which basically the consortiums are that they um, take their resources and then give them to a fiscal agent to manage those funds. The consultation with private schools, if you have your meaningful consultation and you're going to identify which individuals were there um, and um, how many students were identified and what you're going to do with the resources. The school-wide program, budget, and other documentation as needed. Some LEAs um, are required to have their boards approve pieces and they upload some of these notes showing that the board has approved them. So, as I said before, around consortiums overall, um, there's a fiscal agent, um, and there are multiple districts uh, listed on their homepage when they open up the e-grant. Um, basically, the user would select which district the fiscal agent wants to access, and then the fiscal agent has view only to these pieces, but the 
funds have been forwarded to the fiscal agent. So they're the ones who manage the money and then fill out the application. Um, those consortium members, only sections of the IDA information are available to complete it, meaning that the um, budget and those things in relationship to that are forwarded to the fiscal agent. You, as the LAA, still, as the consortium member of that uh, group, still need to complete your maintenance of effort, your excess cost, your assurances, all those sections. And as I said, there is no IDA budget for you to use because the fiscal agent is the one who is taking that over. Make sure you upload your consortium letter of agreement and make sure that's proper. So, the funding application creation. We start with application started, that's your status. You're going to complete the pages of the application and all the different sections. You're going to create your budget, resolve error messages, and then change your status to application completed. The system then will generate an email to the superintendent. You did your side of things, you're all done, it's now to the superintendent. Superintendent logs in, gives the signed quote unquote approval, and it comes along to where he changes his status to approved or revisions needed. Again, that would be within your house if revisions needed. It then comes to my desk and my review and Andrew Bernal's review. We either then approve it or we send it back to you for revisions needed. It doesn't have to go back through the superintendent at that time. It goes directly to you and then we have correspondence back and forth of corrections needed. We review that once it's all validated. We review our checklists, status approved, and again, or returned as needed. All status changes then generate an email of notifications of appropriate roles. Once I approve your grant, you'll get an email stating that it's done, and so will your superintendent. The e-grant in particular is going to be um, posted in the month of March. It's going to be due um, in May. Um, we don't know exactly yet um, those timelines. I'm still waiting, but I'll send out a memo um, letting you know that the um, applications are now live and available for you to access. Again, you can go in and do the test site at any time to practice some of these pieces. And moreover, I'd, I'd suggest that um, with the MOE calculator coming at the end of the month, having some of those pieces in place sooner rather than later is probably a good thing. Um, we have resources with the State Education Resource Center uh, of where um, you can contact them and either through Zoom or phone calls or through um, uh, show up, whatever you need to be able to ensure that your maintenance of effort is, is met uh, or is addressed um, through the MOE calculator and then for the grant application itself. Um, one thing I did want to talk about is around recalculating the grant with the final award dollars. Um, each year, as I talked about, the grants are established by a federal formula, but they're established at the beginning with preliminary dollars. When the formula is completed, which is sometime in early fall, you then have a final award that comes to you, of which I send an email or a memo that says your final award dollars are available to you. And you can see that in the prepayment grant system, that's available. In that, we then need to those districts that have proportionate share or coordinated learning to meeting services comprehensive mandated, which would be a mandated 15% or your proportionate share calculation, those are both addressed and calculated through preliminary dollars. Final award dollars are now in place, so we have to recalculate those numbers so that we have what the real number is. Um, and so basically that happens sometime late, uh, early uh, winter, so that th that deadline is in place. That's something that has to be done um, when it occurs. So. 
Fiscal monitoring is another part of the IDA grant. Um, this happens January 1st through the 31st, uh, basically a year. Um, we have risk factors that we monitor throughout the year for the IDEA grant. Because the LEAs are subgrantees of the State Department of Education's grant from the federal government, um, we have to monitor districts for risk. There is a risk score that is established and it's done through a risk rubric through these risk factors. And basically, we, it's a running risk as well, where we go year to year. Because the grant overlaps and has these two years, we want to be able to identify if there's issues that were happening before that would roll into that next year. Letters for 2019 risk were, have already been sent out. And we only um, uh, identified and um, had a connection with those districts who were in the moderate and high level. Um, those districts um, who would be in high risk for two years in a row, uh, moderate is there's a communication in relationship to you examining things. You're in high risk, there's another worksheet that has to be completed that shows some of your practices and policies. And then if you're in high risk for a second year, a corrective action plan is required. So speaking of the um, uh, changing and elements in relationship to proportionate share and CEIS, these are all done in the PPG or the prepayment grant system. A lot of districts have been a little confused because now we're dealing with two separate systems. The e-grant, which is what your application is through, and then there's the prepayment grant system itself, which uploads your budget, which is the ED114 that we talked about, into the prepayment grant system that allows your business office to download monies on a regular basis to meet the needs of students with disabilities in your district. The business office is only supposed to draw down as much money as they are going to expend over the next month. They're not supposed to be taking money down and, and getting uh, interest on it. And so part of what they have to do is draw the money down and then expend those monies and then continue to do that and request those monies to be drawn down. They don't happen automatically. So let's talk about how budget revision is done because as you go through you're going to want to look at that, right? So the first year budget revisions are due on or before May 1st. That would be the FY20 grant application of 5-1 2020 is when your first year budget revisions are due. The second year budget revisions covering your two year period must be received 60 days prior to the expiration of the grant period, but no later than February 1st of the second year, meaning the 2 1 20 date was for your FY19 application. And the reason why we're doing budget revisions is so that we're aware of what you're expending your funds on and that there are no variances, meaning that the, there's a report that's done that compares what you said you were going to expend and what you expended. And if the total of that grant award is greater than 10% of those changes, we have to talk to you in relationship to say, why did you use funds that were not authorized to be used in that manner. All budgets are done electronically. Again, this is the prepayment grant system. So your business office usually has a password or a mechanism by which to get in there. And part of what is important to me is that you place in the comments box what you're making the change about so that I can have an understanding of why you're making the change sending me an email with that information and that you have put in a budget revision request is important as well because the system doesn't automatically tell me that you put in a revision. There's a policy out there and, and certainly if anybody wants that they can get it on the website or talk to me and I can get you information that you need. So 
Here's an example of the 2019 budget revision. It's a temporary budget revision, and on the middle here is where you'd be entering revised elements. This is what's already been approved by us in relationship to what you're going to be using with the funds. Again, here's the ED114. You have here what in relationship you're going to be doing. And then see how right here there's a difference between 3,000 to 2,500? What happened is there was a change in relationship to those monies. The totals remain the same, but there's an explanation in relationship to an increase employee benefits line. So, budget revision, in order to process it quickly, send me an email explaining what changes you've done. Place need information in uh, for going along because if there's not a lot of information, it can delay my approval process. I'd rather you do multiple smaller ones than even one big one. It makes more sense of when you're going along what you're doing. And again, try to ensure that we're spending older money before new. Um, and if you go past, like if you need changes to earlier years, um, you had an audit and need clarification around what was done, you'd have to contact the Bureau of Grants Management. And I'm always available for any phone calls or whatever you need. Dates to be aware of. Um, we just talked a lot about second year in relationship to that budget revision. It's already done. If you still have some, send it to me and we'll work it out. I'll try and open up the system. Again, Bureau of Grants Management are the ones who are really in charge of that piece. Um, all funds are obligated and expended by the final date of 630. You want to obligate. You want to say what those monies are going to be for and then be liquidated 60 days after that grant. So around the end of August is what we're talking about. <laughs> FY20, um, we got Part B, first year. Um, again, we talked about 5-1. That's when you're going to be doing it. Set aside funds, obligated and expended by June should be the exception, not the rule, that you'd be expending that money. Um, budget revisions for second year completed by 2-1. So next February at this time is when the FY20 second year budget revisions will be put into place. And then as well for FY20, you want to make sure that everything's expended by the end of the grant period of 630 and then liquidated by 830. FY21, application is going to be posted. We said that's probably going to be March. It's going to be due in May. Understand that I get 170 of these, and I try to, within that six-week period of when the application is done through about mid uh, or, or uh, due through mid-June, I'm processing these so that when 7-1 comes, the grant start is available, you'd be able to access those funds. It doesn't always mean that the money is going to be released by both Congress and available for the state to be able to give those funds out. Um, that's why they have that second year carryover. Um, but I always had kind of, for some philosophy, I don't want it to be the Bureau, uh, Bureau of Special Ed to be the problem. Um, we want all of our ducks in a row. Um, so the FY20, IDA Part B, uh, Section Final Award Permanent Accounts coming. And in the past, it's important we spend old money before new because we've had to return money to um, the federal government. And this year is uh, no different. It's actually a little worse. Um, we're having to return some uh, significant amount of funds that LEAs did not expend. Um, and um, the real key there is that we're going to be saying, why aren't we giving resources to students with disabilities? That's what it's about. Um, and unfortunately, then Washington says, well, don't you want these resources, Connecticut? Why are you returning them? So we want to try and expend our funds as much as we can. So to finish up, another Eastern proverb, um, bitten by a snake on one morning, afraid of the rope by the well for 10 years. What that means is I understand that maybe MOE in the past was something you were intimidated by or even the grant process is something you're not feeling comfortable with. I'd encourage you that 
part of what we have to do is push through that and know that this is not the old application and the MOE calculator is here as a tool for us. Um, we can really move forward and have confidence that we're going to be doing good things about meeting the needs of students with disabilities. And that's the purpose of the grant is to assist with the excess cost of that. Um, and I do appreciate your time and I appreciate um, everyone um, you know, putting in the effort in relationship to um, the IDA grant. Um, I'm always available for um, conversation and for support as needed. And um, thank you for um, being here and have a wonderful day.